Our second presenter is uh, Afshin Martin Asghari. Uh, he's professor of history at Cal State LA, where he's a specialist uh, in 20th century Middle East, modern Iran, and modern Islamic political and intellectual movements. Uh, Afshin was uh, born in Tehran, and he moved to uh, the US in his in adolescent years. Uh, at this point, and he became deeply involved in the U.S. in the uh, Iranian uh, student movement abroad against the Shah, against the monarchy. And he then returned uh, to Iran in 79 to participate in the revolution and what uh, ensued thereafter. Um, he, he broke then from the uh, post-revolutionary regime in Iran and came back to the U.S. once again. So uh, in 1993, uh, Afshin received his doctoral degree in Middle East history, just coincidentally from the history department right here, uh, where uh, we many of us uh, had the pleasure of knowing him through his graduate student years. You uh, signed on to it. What? You signed on to it. <laughs> that, that was definitely forged. Um, uh, uh, his, uh, and uh, so his dissertation was published in 2001 as uh, Iranian Student Opposition to the Shah, uh, which was the first comprehensive history of Iran's student movement from its origins into the 1970s. Uh, more recently, he's been for a while uh, preparing a big book uh, called Neither East Nor West, An Intellectual History of Modern Iran, which is going to be coming out. Is it out? Uh, in a few months. It's co coming out, as you can see, uh, from Cambridge. We much, uh, very much look forward uh, to its appearance. Afshin, thank you very much for coming here to help us out. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Okay, it's, it's difficult to uh, follow up on Kevin's presentation. Uh, Kevin asked me to uh, talk about my book and also focus on uh, post-revolutionary left in Iran. Um, now, my book is not on uh, the pre-revolutionary left. It has a focus on the pre-revolutionary left, but it stops at the point of Revolution, because post-revolution would be too too much to cover. So uh, what I'm going to do is um, this is the cover of the book. I'll say a few things about it, but let me first uh, thank Kevin for inviting me. The center, I just call it the Brenner Center. Sorry, the other name is too long. Uh, and uh, one thing about the introduction also is that uh, I give you the conclusion of my. Uh, talk about post-revolutionary left, you know, considering uh, Kevin's work uh, as part of that, I would say the state of post-revolutionary left in Iran, at least intellectually, is pretty, doesn't, doesn't look bad, it's pretty good in terms of understanding and analysis compared to, um, to where we came from. So, um, uh, I'm also happy to be back here in the seminar room where I was sitting uh, with Bob, uh, graduate seminars. It was not about the Iranian Revolution. It was mostly about transition to capitalism, the Brenner debate. So whatever I say here, uh, you know, I have to take uh, credit or blame for it. This is not the things that he taught me. He taught me other things. Um, but it's good to be back here. So I want to organize my talk uh, in the following manner. Uh, first, uh, I'm going to say a few things, introduce the Iranian left's origin and its history up to the 1978-79, the so-called Islamic Revolution. Uh, I will say a few things about the left's participation in the revolutionary process, uh, its historical defeat and destruction during the revolution's early years, and then in some kind of a fast forward, because there I have to cover about 30 years and more, 
I will fast forward to the question of who or what the Iranian left might be today. And then uh, as Kevin finished, everyone is interested in, okay, what about now? What's going on today? Does, does the left have a role in what's coming uh, next? Um, so um, I, as you saw from Bob's introduction, I've become somehow a historian of the Iranian left because of my first book, my dissertation, that was a history of the Iranian student movement uh, abroad. And uh, I've written uh, articles, book chapter, mostly dealing with the history of the left. And uh, this book that uh, I just finished, I, 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 I gave Bob the wrong title. The correct title is both Eastern and Western, an intellectual history of uh, Iranian modernity. The second part was added by Cambridge to make the title a little better than what I had. But uh, the both Eastern and Western is an inversion of the Islamic Republic's official <coughs> label of itself, self-definition, a claim of authenticity, uh, and uh, basically both uh, nationalist slash Islamic authenticity were neither Eastern nor uh, Western. <coughs> in, <coughs> I'm sorry. In all of the meanings of East and West, um, my book basically, if that's one argument, is <coughs> if you look at the intellectual history of 20th century Iran, uh, it's both Eastern and Western in all kinds of meanings of those terms. Uh, thanks. Um, and this picture um, is, I basically convinced the editors to use it. We just pulled it uh, you know, just from the internet. It's a painting by uh, Bijan Jazani, uh, a, a leader of uh, leftist uh, Marxist guerrillas who managed not to die in shootouts because he was imprisoned. And in prison, one of the things he did, in addition to being the theoretician of the movement, he did some painting. This is one of them. In this painting, he has, he has captured uh, this event uh, uh, which takes place in northern forests of Iran at a place called Siakal, which refers uh, to the name of uh, deers, or I don't know if that forest at some point had deers. But so this is a picture of a deer. It's a militant, it's a, it's a gorilla armed in prison. He couldn't put the Kalashnikov in his hands, but he put a sword. And uh, the style of the painting is also, to me at least, uh, no one has paid much attention to this painting. I, I mentioned Jazani in my book, so I thought this is a primary source and is striking, interesting. And to me, even kind of artistically, the style is that mishmash of shows influences, all kinds of influences, cubism, kind of modernism. At the same time, it has uh, religious symbolism. It has the, the hand with, with the eye on it. Uh, there was a phenomenon at that time in Iran, which uh, the government labeled Islamic Marxism, because there were two main uh, underground guerrilla organizations in the 70s fighting the regime. One of them, Jazani's group, was out-and-out Marxist-Leninist. The other one was uh, Islamic and yet openly uh, accepting uh, political uh, aspects of Marxism. They read the Quran um, in terms of class analysis and they sympathized with revolutionary movements around the world. The regime called it Islamic Marxism to show its eclecticism and uh, basically it was an attack label. Jazani again took that label seriously and had a polemic with them that uh, yes, you guys, if you think that you could use Islam instrumentally to incite the masses into a revolution, uh, and this was kind of prophetic, um, you're badly mistaken because Islam is not just hanging in there for you to grab and make with it everything you want. There are some people called the clergy. And on the day of your success in a revolution, they'll drag you down, put you up against the wall, and shoot you. And that's almost exactly what happened. Um, 
He himself, of course, was uh, dragged out of prison and shot, along with eight other of, of his comrades, because the Savak Shah secret police figured out what he was doing, being the brain, to some extent, behind the movement, and they, uh, they killed him. So um, the kind of uh, uh, rationale behind this, this image. But um, let me um, begin with a kind of a quick overview of the pre-revolutionary left and uh, see how far I can get. Um, and of course, I'm using the term left in a very broad sense. And I realize that you know, the meaning of this term also has transformed. And we can talk about that too. So uh, what we can call leftist ideas, uh, socialist, Marxist, uh, reached Iran in early 20th century across the Caucasus. Some of these are points I try to argue in this book, uh, which uh, tries to situate uh, at least the intellectual history of modern Iran more globally and regionally. Um, there are a few other intellectual histories of Iran. One of them is by my good friend Mehzad Bourjerdi, who is here. Uh, I'm going to acknowledge a lot of people in the audience today, uh, including myself. Uh, so <laughs> you'll see I, I managed to, what one of the images you see is me. So you'll see how I pulled the trick, we'll get there. Uh, but um, the studies of uh, intellectual influences on Iran have focused on the West, Iran and the West, in a positive or negative way. One of my arguments was uh, the West, whatever it meant, um, kind of seriously or intensely interacted in Iran really in mid-20th century, if we're, especially if we're thinking about American influence uh, in terms of ideas, um, whereas uh, the origins of Iranian modernity going back to the 19th century are, have a lot more to do with uh, Iran's immediate neighbors, Ottoman Empire, Russian Empire, uh, Russian history, and then Soviet history, I argue, had a much more profound impact on Iran than Western influences. So um, during an event in Iran, early 20th century, called the Constitutional Revolution, 1906, 1910, uh, there was a, an intervention of uh, social democratic and socialist revolutionary armed uh, militants from the Caucasus, from Georgia, from Azerbaijan, and from uh, uh, Armenia. Uh, these were parts of the Russian Empire. Their numbers were not large, but they crossed over. And so it was like the inner action of Russian and Iranian revolutions. And these uh, people came uh, to take part in a civil war to save the Constitution. And they played an important role at a crucial conjuncture. But the more important intervention was the impact of social democratic ideas. Uh, Russian socialism called itself social democracy at that, at that time, the party of Lenin. And uh, so uh, the impact of socialist ideas was articulated once the Constitution was restored in the first political party that appeared in Iran, again, part of modernity being something of a parliamentary system and political parties and political journalism. And uh, social democrats had some kind of intellectual hegemony in that. They, uh, they articulated a program, an agenda. And the agenda was something like this. It was, of course, uh, constitutionalism understood as parliamentary government, uh, where a number of political parties uh, geared to different social bases competed with each other. One of them was the Social Democrats, of course. Immediately, Iran's second political party was formed. And interestingly, the second political party called themselves social moderates because they didn't have an agenda or identity, if you want, of their own. They reacted to the social democrats. So basically, the argument was, and they borrowed the term social, but social moderates. So basically, everything these guys are saying is good, 
but let's kind of take it easy and go slower. Because what they asked, the agenda uh, was um, pretty comprehensive. It was the international agenda of social democracy kind of geared to Iran, uh, uh, freedom of the press, political expression, association, equal citizenship rights, regardless of class, gender, ethnicity, religion, separation of political religious powers, land reform, labor protection laws, progressive taxation, public education, health care. Um, I can't perform for the camera because I'm not so sure I want this to be seen all over the place. But uh, so I'm hiding. Um, so um, some of this translates later as um, uh, the prototype of a welfare state. Par part of the argument of my book is the Pahlavi regime, and early in the revolution, the Islamic Republic plagiarized a lot uh, from uh, the left. Um, and one of my friends who's here suggested, no, the term plagiarism is not technically correct, so I changed it. Right. But the idea was they borrowed, copied, uh, raided uh, these ideas. And uh, uh, Kevin also in his book acknowledged uh, that this was the case, but I go into a lot more detail showing this over uh, kind of uh, a longer period of time. Uh, so um, uh, one issue that um, these early social democrats in Iran faced, like their Russian counterparts, was okay, we have this agenda. This is the middle of a revolution because the revolution, again, was nothing compared to the 1979 revolution, but it had the beginning of popular participation. There were popular militias who had fought, taken up arms to drive out a despotic Shah and restore a constitutional regime. So the revolution had potential, it had promise. Um, but the question was, is this a bourgeois revolution, or might it be a socialist revolution, or is it a revolution in stages? Exactly the same kind of questions that were posed in Russia. And I have another colleague who I hope would be here, Janet Ofari, has, has written a work on Iran's constitutional revolution, and she mentions, and others have said this too, that these guys uh, actually wrote to people like Kautsky and Plakhanov and asked them, what do you guys think we should do in Iran is this can we go all the way for socialism or no we have to temper it and this country is not even capitalist so what the heck are we going to do and the answer prudently by Plakhanov and Kautsky was you know just again take it easy just the horizon is doesn't look much beyond like a bourgeois democratic revolution uh, but uh, even accomplishing that proved a tall order because the constitutional regime went out of commission because um, the Russians occupied northern Iran. Once the Tsar cleared back home, they took care of 1905 revolution, which was what had tied his hands because he was the benefactor and supporter of Iranian despotism. He sent his troops to occupy northern Iran and constitutional regime was just on paper. Then World War I came and all of the country was occupied. So. Um, uh, the Constitution remained in name, but not uh, the revolution never had a chance to deepen and, and continue. Now, uh, immediately after World War I, the Russian Revolution, or during the last year, the Russian Revolution happened, and that had a tremendous impact, introduced a whole new paradigm of revolution uh, into the entire world, including Iran. And the Russian Revolution spilled over into Iran. In fact, a small detachment of the Red Army landed south of the Caspian, where a bunch of rebels were fighting in the forest of Gilan, the same place, more or less, that the 1970s guerrillas were taking as that inspiration. And that was deliberate. That historical memory was deliberately chosen, taking to the forest, growing your beards. They did it way before Che and Fidel. And well, of course, people had done it before them too. Uh, but these are called the men of the forest. They're nationalistic, constitutionalist, and here's the Red Army chasing the whites. Um, not with very many, with hundreds, but the, the number of troops of the Shah and Tehran was also in like, not in tens of thousands, so small numbers could mean a lot. And basically proposed, why don't we form a Soviet socialist republic 
and march on Tehran and take it and get it over with. And it, it wasn't a bad deal, sounded good. Iran was uh, occupied. Uh, the Russian occupation had been toppled. The British were in charge. They were in Tehran. They're holding Tehran by military force. And uh, this, of course, didn't work. The Soviet Socialist Republic collapsed within a year or so because of uh, tension, conflict, misunderstanding, uh, crazy things that the communists also did. Uh, and uh, left a very bad taste uh, between Iranian nationalism, even uh, revolutionary nationalism, and uh, Bolshevism. Um, the Bolsheviks patched things up with uh, the British. They made their 1921 global pact, and uh, they withdrew from Iran. And part of the deal was we leave and you guys leave. And the British were going to leave because they were overextended. They couldn't stay longer. They had to leave. And, uh, but before the British left, there was an attempt by the armies of the, the Soviet Republic to march on Tehran and get it over with. And they couldn't only because the British presence in Tehran. So again, um, you know, it's uh, things where if you had lived at that moment, the idea of a red Iran, I'm not saying it would have happened and then everything would have been hunky-dory afterwards, but they came very close. Uh, then things took an entirely different turn. Uh, and uh, basically, I, I don't want to dwell on like the backgrounds of Iranian history, which is necessary, but I can't get into that. A right-wing uh, semi-military dictatorship uh, led by an army colonel that the British evacuating armies had put in charge, um, stabilized uh, into a kind of a regime, one of those inner war semi-military authoritarian uh, regimes that uh, uh, implemented a, a program of um, top-down authoritarian modernization state building and uh, part of his program was to snuff out or uh, take care of uh, this fledgling uh, socialist and communist movement in Iran. They were cleared out and thrown out in prison. And um, so um, under Reza Shah, uh, there couldn't be much of a leftist presence. But there was an interesting exception from the point of intellectual history, and that was a brief appearance of a magazine uh, by the name of Donia. The name was Le Monde, translated into Persian. And Donia was uh, the kind of a guiding uh, intellectual behind it was Tari Arani, who was a um, leftist intellectual Marxist, uh, educated, uh, he was actually a scientist, uh, physics and chemistry in uh, Berlin. And so he was a, um, uh, uh, some kind of the project that he had in this magazine, he wasn't alone, but he was uh, the recognized figure behind this, uh, was some kind of a semi-Gramscian, I don't think he knew Gramsci, but uh, um, the idea was uh, before uh, uh, you talk about class struggle, there has to be a pedagogical, uh, you have to teach uh, the socialist intellectual elite has to teach socialism to the masses. And the socialist intellectual elite is, is us, is intellectual, the middle class intellectuals. And uh, so um, uh, Marxism, socialism, they, they couldn't use those terms, but they're talking about a worldview that was modernist and Marxist, but some kind of a Marxist pedagogy, some advocacy of a socialist intellectual hegemony. Now, uh, the thing is, these are part of the arguments I try to develop in, in my book. Uh, this actually materialized. Arani typically was picked up, thrown into prison, and uh, he either died or they caused him to die, as Iranian prisons has this kind of interesting tendency that people commit suicides in them or uh, <laughs> easily die. So he too perished. 